Oh yeah, guys, I'm gonna record this okay. session so that este, we have a copy of this and we can share it with people that can, couldn't join. Killer, okay. Talia, if it's okay with you, we'll kick off. I think that's a perfect idea. All right. Go ahead. Um, guys, we may have a few more trickling in and um, they might miss the intro, but that's okay. I really appreciate everybody joining. I need to um, put a disclaimer that this is the first time that I've done a live webinar ever. And uh, Talea has been organizing all of this and she's amazing. She's our marketing director in CJI. So she's going to kind of moderate the whole thing and uh, hopefully um, interrupt if I do anything really stupid. Uh, but generally, our goal with this is just to share knowledge. That's it. Um, well, we'll get into it. But development as a whole is so important. We'll go into that as well. Um, and doing it responsibly is so important um, because of the rate that the uh, earth is being developed. And how do we want to do it, right? How do we want to do it in a way that is responsible? How do we want to do it in a way um, that has uh, minimal to positive impact and, and um, uh, I'm going to go through. I have to admit I'm, I'm slightly nervous because this is my first time. So again, please bear with me. Uh, but, you know, all's there. So here, let me click this and figure out how to work it. Great. So I'm Jack. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I, the bio is not, it's a little deceiving. My, my captain's license is expired, so that's not actually accurate. Um, but in general, I'm the uh, founder of CJI. CJI is a design, development, and construction firm based in the U.S. and Costa Rica. Uh, we've done projects all over the world, Asia, Europe, the Caribbean, North America, Central America, South America. Um, personally, uh, I've been involved in probably... At this point, uh, maybe 25, 26 hotels uh, from start to finish, um, real estate communities, retreat centers, all different projects of different types in different parts of the world. Um, I was in corporate America for about 15 years um, prior to uh, realizing that it would be much more fun to, rather than kind of wearing two hats where you know, or two lives, I guess, where I'm like festival, you know, long hair on the weekends and corporate America guy on during the week giving talks on bank information security or whatever it is. Um, and combine that and just be the same person all the time and the same uh, belief system all of the time. Uh, and started doing development in 2012. Uh, my first community was a great um a great way to cut my teeth. It was a 400 acre sustainable development in a small island in the Caribbean. It was our first organic golf course in the world. Uh, it was uh, a full utility infrastructure for uh, 200 acres of organic gardens. Um, really a fun, interesting project to learn on. And um, since then, have every project since has been another learning experience. And everyone is added to the lessons learned that we then recoup and um, and learn from and do more. So uh, we're here today just to share some tips because we've found that so many calls that I'm on with people uh, trying to start communities or wanting to build hotels or even wanting to do a residential home. Um, I say the same things lots of times to the same people. <laughs> And uh, we have a strong belief inside of CJI and cooperation and making sure that kind of everybody, um, everybody is able to act responsibly, right? Whether it's CJI doing the work or somebody else doing the work, we would prefer that um, the work is done responsibly. And so we're starting this knowledge sharing series to uh, help promote that initiative. And um, uh, yeah, just enable you to be able to do the good that we want to see happen in the world. So that's a, that's the short. Um, that's why we're here. 
what is responsible development we'll go over we'll go over the seven ideas of responsible development i'm going to add in a, probably a couple supplementals uh, we'll take 45 minutes for that and then we'll take 45 minutes just for questions we might you know i might talk way too fast and we'll finish my part in 15 minutes who knows um, you guys might not have any questions and we finish that in 15 minutes and we'll see how the time goes but we blocked an hour and a half and very grateful for everyone taking the time and joining the presentation. I'm going to try and control my own slides, so we'll see how that goes as well. So the first one, why are we here? Um, Talea pulled these statistics, which I found actually really interesting, in that as of right now, 14% 14 of the world um, has been touched by humans, right? But the next one, a little more astounding, is that just over half a percent of the world is being developed every year, right? So you put that into context, let's assume that 200 years from now, 100% of the world is de developed. And so one of the ideas, honestly, that's not on the seven is uh, the concept of redevelopment, which is something that the, our company, that CJI has, has focused more on recently, um, is how we can redevelop old spaces as opposed to new spaces. And so I think this is a pretty important aspect and an idea for people to consider if you're looking at doing communities or looking at doing a hotel is rather than building on green space uh, um, how can we redevelop something that is already an eyesore or, or you know not successful in its own way and uh, and create it so just a just an idea to be thinking through because how we approach the growth will have a massive impact on the planet right human interaction it's an interesting thing because when we talk a lot about ecosystems and and um, you know how how to interact with nature, it's important that we remember that people are a big part of nature, right? They're a big part of the ecosystem, and just like how a, a tiger or a turtle or a rabbit moves through the through nature, how humans move through nature is also uh, an important aspect, and, and they don't always do it right. So how can we help steer humans to, um, to interact with nature in a more responsible fashion than maybe we have historically? Right, so we need to approach development with responsibility. Thanks, Talea. I'll try and, I should have memorized these slides probably, but I didn't. So what is responsible development, right? This is a big one. Um, we'll say the, the Google uh, definition management of human relationships with the natural environment so that economic, social, and cultural needs are met and ecological processes and natural diversity are maintained, right? It's actually, it's a pretty good, a pretty good um, definition. We used to, we started uh, this ver version of CJI in 2016. And at first we, we touted ourselves as a sustainable development firm, right? And then this was, you know, six years ago, this was when the term regeneration was really starting to, to take more traction. We said, well, we, we're actually, we're more focused on being a regenerative development company. And, and then, we, then we realized that the word sustainable and the words regenerative get pulled apart so much by um, uh, nitpickers that we, we really finally settled on the term responsible development. Right. We feel like responsible development is really uh, the way of the future. Um, you know, it takes into account socioeconomic and cultural needs um, and doesn't quite fall under the scrutiny of, you know, well, you didn't do this right, or you didn't do this right, or that's not regenerative, or this isn't regenerative. All projects, in all honesty, um, sometimes there are sacrifices. The goal is to do it responsibly, do it the best that it can be done and to not do it if it can't be done responsibly. So super important for us. So inside of CJI, um, we kind of define it as allowing the design and creation of spaces to always have a positive impact on the planet and people, right? So in CJI, we do architectural design, um, interior design, master planning of spaces, consulting on financials and different things in communities or hotels or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, I'm, I think I'm leaving lots of out actually, and then obviously construction management of building those spaces out. So really 
making sure that that design and that creation always has a positive impact, not a negative impact, right? Um, Talia, I'm gonna trust you to just interrupt me if anything strange happens and my voice goes weird or et cetera, et cetera, right? So I'm monitoring. I can't see anyone. Thank you. We can hear you perfectly. We're, You're doing great. Amazing, <laughs> amazing, yeah. Um, so what do we do? How do we handle it, right? So here's just, you know, we're gonna go through seven tips. We could go into 107 tips, right? Uh, but we would, you know, maybe take 45 minutes instead of the 15 that we're promised. So um, the first one, idea one, assessing the community's needs to define impact metrics, right? So CGI is a company, we, we focus on a project management approach to everything that we do. I mean, my corporate career before development was always project management, right? And in project management, we have this thing where we plan the work and then we do the work, right? We're just wrapping up in the next two months and some of you are involved the Alegria community in Costa Rica. Alegria, we spent an immense amount of time planning uh, the activities and so that we could then execute in an in a efficient manner. We're now four years into the project and a four year project in Costa Rica um, during the times of the pandemic to complete a project like this with 150 lots, más o menos, um, with full infrastructure, you know, first world infrastructure, um, you know, HOA guidelines, HOA handover uh, is the result of a lot of planning. Part of that planning on any project should be defining the impact metrics that go into the project. Whether you are a corporation, whether you're starting a hotel, whether you're starting a residential community, whether you're starting a residential build, you can call it a value analysis or you can call it a definition of impact metrics, but really looking at what the important things are for you in the result helps you measure if you're actually doing it well or not, right? We all, we all know that, and if you're joining this call, everybody knows that your intention is in the right place, right? We know that we're, we, we mean to do well, but it's really an amazing phenomenon when you, when you define those impact and actually you put metrics against it, the, the eye opener on what, on really how well, how well are you doing? How, let's measure how well we are doing, right? And so for every project that we go into now, we have a full um, breakdown of, what those metrics are. And they may include things like how many jobs are created, how many local jobs are created, how many disabled jobs are created. Um, uh, let's see, you know, and we'll talk about this. This is one of the ideas later, but what is the infiltration rate, the filtration rate of the soil when you start? What's the filtration rate of the soil when you get through, meaning how much water goes through in back into the ecosystem? Um, you know, how, how much of your uh, supplies and materials are sourced locally and how much are sourced from overseas, right? So without too much, we've, we've started to get into the measuring of carbon uh, footprint, but just some of the general things, we know that materials sourced from the other side of the globe, unless there's other components involved, are typically going to be a larger carbon footprint than materials that are sourced locally, right? So actually defining what those metrics are and then measuring them through the course of the project is a super important part of sustainable development. So, wait a minute, right. And so assessing the community's needs is another big part of that as well. So prior to going into any project, we'll do an analysis of what the actual community is and what the community needs um, are because how am I gonna say this? We, we've seen in building expat communities, for example, that there's the idea of privilege, right? And, um, and a lot of expats, a lot of uh, North Americans or Europeans that are going into a place like Costa Rica, for example, say, well, you know, we need to bring our, our, our privilege to them, right? We need to bring our first world ideas to them. And, and we assume a lot of the time uh, what the community might need that we're going into, right? And 
in truth, when it comes down to it, a lot of the time, those communities, they already have all, all of the food they need to eat. They already have all of the um, uh, transportation, you know, our, our measurement or, or the first world measurement of what a third world might need is might be very, very different from what the actual need is. So, you know, working with some with someone local in the environment that you're going into, to the point of going door to door on all of those, um, uh, with all of those questions, to really define what that community needs that you're going into, right? And we've taken that to the point of making sure that when we define a budget for a particular project, we define what money needs to be allocated to um, the needs of that community, right? And making sure that we're allocating funds to meet the needs that were defined in the start, right? So it's um, it's the need, the the metrics on the community impact, and then and it's the metrics on every other aspect that you're hoping to achieve when you go into a new project, and then through the project, measuring those metrics against. You know, I, I'm I'm a little uncertain on how we're going to handle this after the webinar, but generally we're pretty open source in CJI about. Um, different templates and things that you can use for this so if there's any you know requests we'll likely share out a lot of these templates so that you can use them yourself modify them however you need to and um, and measure your impact for not only the community but every other metric that you want to measure how was that delay did i speak too fast is everything okay Yes, Jack. Uh, okay, you, great, thanks. It's 5.22, by the way. Perfect. <laughs> um, the next one, choosing local providers to improve economic conditions in the community, right? And you can define community. You can define mm -hmm. it as the, the immediate surrounding area, right? The village that you're in. You can define it on a larger municipality. You can define it on the country level, right? Um, but an example, you know, we, we were... I was consulting with a, a hotel in, um, I don't think Jonathan is on here. Jonathan is the, the lead of STS security. I don't think I sent him the link, um, but it's an example, right? We, we uh, were consulting on a hotel build in Las Catalinas in Costa Rica. Um, it was a 27 key hotel, probably a $12 million development budget. Um, and they were looking for providers for keyless entry. Um, uh, you know, the RFID car key cards that go into the hotel. And we contacted Salto, uh, which is a provider of these systems, um, you know, and they said, we can help you directly, or there's a local guy that is trying to start a security company that, um, uh, you know, that may want the work. And so we, we talked to this guy, Jonathan, who's a fantastic um, fellow. And he was just coming out of the gate you know, he, he, uh, he, he was new, but he was very capable. We gave him the contract for all of the keyless locking systems, which was much more than the 27. It was the biggest contract he'd ever gotten. It allowed him to kickstart uh, his company. He now is the largest security provider in Costa Rica. He has over 200 employees. And he's actually working on, the last I spoke with him, he's working on how to create a community specifically for his employees. That um, that is, I'll, I'll say, a, a first world um, structure uh, and facilities, but at a price point that his employees can all afford. Um, and another example, the, that first project I mentioned in 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 the Caribbean, we had we built about 180 pools there, and so the coping that goes around all of the pools. Um, we outsourced that to a local guy who was trying to start a prefabricated concrete company for concrete pieces. And he had got the contract for all of the pool copings that go around 180 pools. It was the largest thing he'd ever seen. He was able to start a very successful, um, very large prefabricated concrete company. Um, just, you know, the benefit of working for local providers and then the, the honestly, the, the feel good that you see, which is a, a lot of 
um, what we'll talk about during this is kind of that triple bottom line approach. Is your investment coming? Is the return from the investment just financial or is it also give back, right? Uh, and so um, choosing local providers is a huge part of making sure we go through sustainable development, responsible development. Low impact materials. So the background you see here is, um, is a common building that Federico, I think he's on the call actually designed um, in Alegria village in Costa Rica and San Mateo. Um, this one was all bamboo. We have a big, I, I think, yeah, this one's all on bamboo. Hold on one second, low impact materials. So, you know, when we talk about low impact, it, it, there's um, two options in this presentation we'll talk about, which is bamboo and bahareke. Um, you know, bamboo is super sustainable, grows really fast. It's funny, actually, this weekend, we just, um, I, I'm in Virginia right now, and we have about two acres of bamboo randomly on my property. And so we built a bamboo shower. It's so amazing to cut down the building materials um, from your property and build what you need and know that it's going to and completely regenerate in, you know, three to five years. So. Um, Bamboo is a great material. Bahareke, uh, sorry, some other examples of other um, other architects' bamboo designs. These are not CJIs, uh, but great to reference. Um, and Bahareke is is the same, right? It's a it's a mix of um, local soil um, and straw, and it's incredibly um, uh, insulating. Uh, it can be found just about anywhere. In the US, it's very rare that anything will be built out of this, um, but it's also very possible that it can be built out of this. And in um, other countries, in Costa Rica, for example, Bajareque is used all of the time, uh, super healthy. Other ones that would be considered, um, you know, hempcrete has gotten a big, um, a lot of notoriety these days. Um, there's pros and cons of it depending on the location in the world, but hempcrete is, you know, fire resistant, moisture resistant, natural, uh, hemp crops can be regenerated in six months to 12 months tops. Uh, it's a super, super material and branching off of hempcrete. There's a company in Costa Rica, for example, Z Green Labs who are amazing people, amazing to work with. Hemp for construction is now legal in Costa Rica. Um, and uh, they've started using other materials because uh, up until about six months ago, or I don't remember exactly, but recently in the last year, hemp was not legal in Costa Rica. So they were using hempcrete almost to bring in, uh, it's almost like a bait and switch. <laughs> Sorry if anybody from Z Green Labs is on the call, but you bring in um, somebody because hempcrete is sexy, but then they were developing uh, sugarcrete, um, coconutcrete, rice crete, basically using byproducts from other industries to create a, uh, um, uh, a compound that has the same qualities as concrete for the most part, structurally not so much, um, but is incredibly better for the environment uh, and actually has um, additional qualities that concrete doesn't offer. So anyway, Bahareke, Bamboo, hempcrete. I'll also talk about aircrete. I think Julian is on the call. Julian is our resident aircrete expert inside of CJI. Um, but it's basically the same. It's a <coughs> concrete mix, but uses maybe 10% of the cement compound content um, in the mix beyond what concrete would use. So they, you mix the cement, you mix up the concrete, and inject air bubbles into it. So the end result is, call it a concrete wall or a concrete slab or whatever form you're doing, concrete countertop, et cetera, but it's full of air bubbles, right? And so it's incredibly light. One of you and I could pick up a 10 by 10 panel, right, of aircrete, uh, but still has the same acoustic capabilities, still has the same strength capabilities, not structural, but infill between structural columns. So what do we talk about? Aircrete, hempcrete, bamboo, bahareke, just a few examples of uh, local materials that are available or more responsible materials that are available. This is some, an example of some bahareke walls. 
um, that were built in different locations. The building we showed earlier, the, um, the hive at Alegria, uh, utilizes hemp, I'm sorry, Bajareque in um, the bathroom walls, any of the walls that we're doing inside, the same with the yoga building there. Okay, passive strategies and designs by considering climate and land conditions, right? Uh, so um, I think I see, for some reason, Federico is on my list of Zoom attendees that I see in the top, but he's kind of our, our leader inside of CJI for, um, uh, for climactic design. And basically, whether you're building a hotel, whether you're building a full residential community, or whether you're building a home, just paying attention to uh, the uh, orientation of the structure or of the master plan or of you know, your reception and guest rooms, um, the sun's orientation, the wind's orientation. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's more here that I'm not thinking. Of. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the rain's orientation, just on how much is coming in and how. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's these minor, it's these minor um, things to think about that we just don't, we, most people, most developers, most builders don't necessarily think about. It's a, it's a very small recognition of what could make it more responsible, but without, um, oh, I, don't, I don't know where I was going with that a small recognition of what can make it more responsible uh, and then implementing that into the design, right? So the design of any space should take into account whatever those climate conditions are. Okay, hiring locally. Um, hiring locally to have a positive impact on the community. This is another one, again, just in regards to defining your metrics. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Let's see, we don't have an example on that, um, but th there's not a whole lot to say about it. We, uh, as an example, I guess, that first project in the Caribbean, the village that we were in had 100% employment, right? And 100, we, we hired everybody in the village that was willing to work. Um, in CJI, for example, in every community that we go into, we hire an ex the majority of the employees locally. Um, and it's really amazing and really heartwarming to see how much it turns around. It's very easy. A lot of this stuff, I have to say, a lot of it is more complicated and some of it is more expensive, not as much as it used to be. Um, but you'll find as you go out for investment in community projects or in hotel projects or, or whatever your investment is, there's so much investment available now um, where maybe someone could receive a 25 or 30% IRR before. Now they're willing to accept a 15 or 20% IRR, which is still quite good. Um, also knowing that they're getting, um, uh, they're getting the feel good as well. And they know that they're, they know that they're, giving back, right? So those returns, that triple bottom line approach of not presenting the project to an investor first as um, this is what the financial returns are, but almost the first page of your pitch deck being, this is what the impact returns are. This is how many people we're going to hire on the community. This is the economic effect that this is going to have on the community. Um, and then the, the second page can be the financials. Oh, and by the way, you're also going to make money on it but but that's not the important thing the important thing is this is what's good for the world this is what's good for the local community um anyway hiring locally to have a positive impact on the community taking an environmentally friendly approach okay so this one is um we could probably talk for an entire hour and a half about taking an environmentally friendly approach but when you're defining those metrics these are metrics that you can define. These are value propositions that you can define as you go through your planning phase. Um, some of them are, are very measurable. Human waste, for example, um, is not so measurable. I, I guess it is in different ways, but there's lots of different options, right? So again, in a typical development, whether it's a home, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a residential community, whether it's a commercial, whatever, um, you go with a standard solution, right? We're going to go with septic tanks, or we're going to go with, um, you know, a, a waste treatment system, or, you know, 
we're going to connect to the local utility. There's a lot of options for human waste, um, whether it is a methane digester that um, can then uh, convert the, the waste to electricity, whether it is uh, composting toilets, which are controversial in some areas, but done correctly are amazing for your garden. Um, whether it is uh, some alternative waste treatment plants. For example, uh, there's a company we work with a lot called BioNest. And BioNest does uh, make sure that the affluent that comes out of the waste treatment plant, which is basically a, a, a modified septic tank, so to speak, but has lots of stuff going on inside, so that the affluent that comes out is less than 50, um, let's see, 50 pathogens, they, they claim less than 15 pathogens per million parts per million pathogens parts per million, um, which means that the affluent, the, the liquid that comes out of the, the septic tank can be used for irrigation on edible plants, right? So lots of options with human waste. It's one of these defaults that a lot of groups will just go to whatever the, the off the shelf solution is but there's lots of more creative solutions that can provide a uh, more positive impact. Trash handling is another big one, right? How are we handling the trash, not just during the development, but also how are we planning for the trash collection and trash handling for the future, right? One thing we don't talk about in this presentation is the benefits of um, behavior-based design, right? So whether we are in a community or whether we are designing our own home, what are, the, um, what are the behaviors that we want to see, right? What are the behaviors we want to create in ourself? And I'll use two examples. One of them, super basic. When, I'm, when I get out of bed in the morning, okay, I want, the first thing I want to do is meditate, right? Okay, so let me design my house so that when I get out of bed, there's a meditation altar right next to the bed, right? Super simple. When designing a community, okay, we want everybody to compost and recycle a lot more than just throw away their trash, right? So how do we make that design so that we steer the behavior of the community more towards recycling and composting than trash collection, right? So maybe the composting and the recycling is right next to the central hub of the community where the trash collection is on the other side of the community, right? So just how are we handling trash? Um, power generation is probably a more common that everyone knows of. Uh, you know, obviously we have solar and wind and geothermal and, and now a little bit more coming out of the gate with, um, uh, um, with water, with hydro. Uh, you know, typical large scale infrastructure, hydro plants are, are not a very sustainable solution. They have negative impacts on communities and on the environment. But there's smaller hydro plants that are now becoming available if you live near water sources. Um, there's another one that is pretty neat. Actually, if anybody's interested, check out kitepower.com. Um, this looks like a, a kite surfing kite that just rises up. It's, it's much prettier, I think, than wind. And it generates power on a long cable that goes around a spool. And so as the wind drops, the kite goes down. As the wind increases, the kite goes up and the spool turns and generates power. They have, you know, multiple megawatt um, power generation systems available. So for residential community, particularly, these are great uh, options. Tree removal or lack of, right? Let's talk about how many trees we can plant rather than how many trees you can remove. Um, it goes back to the uh, redevelopment rather than development, right? When we're looking at uh, development projects, we walk away for the most part, CGI anyway, for development projects that are in completely forested areas, we'd much rather develop areas that are previously cow pastures, right? Or something else that, um, that where the land really does need to be regenerated, right? So limiting the amount of trees you remove, of course, preferably um, emphasizing the amount of trees that you can plant. Road surfacing. Uh, for those of you in the Alegria community that are on here now, this is a big topic on uh, there. And it's a big topic in any development that we do, right? We've been looking for different solutions, and honestly, since my first project, on what the best road surfacing solutions are. There's um, uh, permeability is one of the biggest aspects to road surfacing. Are we taking all of the water and are we creating a large runoff that 
has all of the toxins and all the things that get collected onto roads and sending it into the water systems? Um, or are we creating permeable solutions that allow rainwater, et cetera, to filter through the surface into the groundwater system? Um, there's, there's lots of pros and cons. This is a, a we, we could talk probably the whole hour and a half about road surfacing. Um, but paying attention to what road surfacing you're using in your project uh, is extremely valuable. Soil infiltration. So on every uh, land project that we do, we measure the filtration rates of the soil when we start and we measure at the end. It's part of our metrics to make sure that that property is actually filtering um, more water than it was when we started. Obviously trees, everything else helps a lot with that. Food production. So when it comes to the idea of resiliency, um, you know, which has been a, a huge hot topic for everyone since the pandemic, we've seen it in Costa Rica and huge increases in relocation um, with resiliency, but food production, how, how much can you produce? Fruit trees are not expensive. Vegetables are not expensive. What can you do with food production inside of your community? Rather than building fences, you know, let's let's build landscapes, right? It's a it's a you you create the same privacy and you can create the same security in some capacity uh, done correctly. But how much food can can we reproduce, and how can we measure that as we go through? Uh, and then educational programs, <coughs> excuse me, is one of the most exciting I think opportunities with any larger real estate development. Whether again, it's a community or a hotel, there's so many opportunities to um, uh, influence. I guess is a is a um, is a fair word. Uh, people to do things more responsibly, right? And so you can you can make that more formal in creating a, an education center and bringing in um, students that want to build, want to work and want to learn at the same time. Um, and then you can also uh, use it for local contractors. So this is something on a community we just worked on in, in Virginia or in other um, communities that are uh, in, how do I say this? In Costa Rica, we have, a, we have an advantage where everyone in Costa Rica, a lot of the people that come to Costa Rica are already in the same mindset. A lot of the people that are in Costa Rica are already in the same mindset of responsible activities, right? When it comes to these sorts of things. In other parts of the world, and, and also even in Costa Rica, putting in those requirements for contractors um, on how they are doing their supply chain, how are they are handling their runoff from cement, for example, um, you know, how they're handling trash, how are they are treating their employees, all of these things, a development with a large enough um, with large enough subcontracts has amazing amount of influence on how those contracts are handled, right? And how those contractors actually work. Even if it's a contractor that's used to doing things like the status quo, like, you know, the human race has done them, you know, for 200 years. We, we, it's a, it, they, they can see that, oh, actually, oh, well, I'm required to do it this way for this project, so I'm going to do it. But actually, then I see the benefit of it, right? Oh, wow, it actually works better. And so it's a, you have an amazing amount of influence with any sort of realist, any sort of development, even in some cases, just a residential home build um, to influence local providers into doing actions more responsibly. So, um, you know, it, it's almost like every every project in some way has the opportunity to be a living laboratory uh, and a living education center on moving forward. Idea number seven, idea. It's funny, these are called ideas. Offering fair wages and additional benefits to teams. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think this goes without saying, but um, the better you treat people, likely the better they will do, right? Um, so looking at things like extra vacation, sick days, you know, reduced schedules, I'm a, I'm a bit on the fence about beneficial if, if you have the right team for sure. Um, making sure they have educational stipends, making sure they have wellness benefits, making sure they have fair wages, not just fair, but, but overly fair, right? Um, with, you know, when you're developing your pro forma for, uh, 
a community build or for a hospitality build or anything else, I guess, you know, you, it's all Excel. You're, you're all working numbers and, you know, fair wages, above average wages, good benefits for the teams that are involved will typically result in a much better product and a much happier workforce. And it's, again, it's amazing how much this trickles down to the community, right? A lot of our projects in CJI are in small towns or on islands or small communities, right? Where um, a large percentage of the local workforce actually works for the development, right? During the time of the development. And I'll, I'll take an example on that Caribbean island in the first one, the island was 40,000 people. We had about 600 people on the job site at any given day. Let's assume each one of those 600 people had an average of three people in their family, right? Um, so it, it's, it's an amazing number, the amount of impact you can have on um, a local community just by treating people well, right? They, they see, oh, wow, this is a company, it can actually be treated well. Oh, and other companies will start to do the same, right? So, um, uh, so you know, providing above average benefits for your teams uh, has a trickle down effect that is immeasurable. It's, you know, you, you'll see it and you'll feel it, but you can't measure it as part of the metrics. And it's super fun. Um, that's number seven. And I think it looks like I talked for 53 minutes after our five minute late start. So it feels like no time to meet Talea. I don't know if we need to take a 10 minute break. Talea is managing the whatever chat responses, I think, um, for anybody. And if anybody needs to use the bathroom, I guess we'll go ahead and um, turn of our cams and, uh, and give everybody a chance to take a quick break. And then we'll come back and, and um, I think most of this presentation is for Q&A. So. Uh, we'll be here to answer any questions that you have. So yeah. quick 10 minute break. Perfect. So to, it's not to make a question, I just found out, <laughs> <It's> to ask <laughs> something, <laughs> to question us, <laughs> please just, uh, basically raise your hand, go to the reactions uh, icon on the Zoom thing. And select raise hand, and I will uh, unmute you so that you can ask your question. Um, now, the idea is to, to open up a conversation and to have some space for any of you that might have a, a question or for Jack. Oh, well, I'm looking at. <clears throat> Everybody, no hands raised, no questions. Yeah, and just so we know, the questions oh. can be about anything, right? Not a, not it doesn't have to be about something we've talked about so far. But if you have your own project or you have your own thoughts or you have your own suggestions that may be beneficial to the group, um, please feel free to contribute. There's, Hello, there's one, Patty. Patty. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, this is Patty. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to know about the names of some of the hotels or projects you have built, so I can check where the results of this wonderful world work. I know only uh, sure, Alegria yeah. Village. Yep, Alegria is a, the, the, currently the largest community we have under development. Um, other hotels would include uh, Catition Hill. Uh, and that was a project in St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Um, the, uh, the Bird's Nest, which was a project in um, Koh Phangan in Thailand. Um, the project that we worked on with STS Security was the uh, Casa Chameleon at Las Catalinas, which is not the most sustainable project by any means, but we implemented as many sustainable op options as we could. Um, uh, I was a development lead for uh, uh, all of the Selena hotels, which I admittedly left that role because they did not have the focus on sustainability that was originally committed. Mm -hmm. um, stand by. 
Uh, we have a project in Big Bear, California right now called Wolf Creek Hotel. It's hotels specifically that you asked about, so I'm, I'm repeating hotels. Um, the Holos project, and it's a retreat center in um, Dominical in Costa Rica. Um, Onda. Ah, yes, I'm sorry, Onda, which um, Onda actually has a, a strong backing on sustainability. It's great. It's in Playa Grande in, in Costa Rica. Okay. Um, what else am I forgetting? If I think of any more, uh, I'm happy to raise them. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Patty. We'll go to uh, Daniel Wu. Thanks, uh, great presentation so far. I was just curious on the um, the KPI for, for so oil infiltration um, as far as being able to track that before and after development um, what's the what's the methodology that you guys are currently implementing um, you know is it basically taking soil infiltration rates throughout the property in various locations um, and you know to the extent that you can share you know what are the what are some of the measures that you guys are taking in order to increase Water filtration um, in your soils. That'd be that'd be helpful to know. I thought that was an interesting KPI that I haven't seen in across other developers. Totally. And Daniel, if you want to um, send your email address up after, I'm happy to share some previous results. But basically, it's exactly what you said. It's taking soil tests at different parts of the property um, before the development starts. And from our perspective, it'd be Either way, you have to do them kind of throughout the development for other purposes. But our most important KPI is take it at the beginning and take it at the end and see what the delta is between the two. Um, and it, you know, taking it at the beginning really drives into the designs, right? Of like what your infrastructure designs are for the project in regards to how you're handling stormwater primarily. Um, and, but, but that, that, Exactly what you said. It's a soil test before and it's a soil test at the end. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send, you, send you my email and we can, uh, we, we can discuss that. Yeah, totally. You know, another one you. that's kind of fun that we just did recently on a project that we had not done before is, um, uh, is the heat output from the property. So we actually had a drone survey with a thermal reader on the drone that measured the thermal output of the land because we planned to, it was a, just a uh, farm field before and we were implementing all sorts of agricultural and uh, both food forest and then a lot of um, cover crops. And so looking at the thermal output of the land before and the thermal output at the end was a really interesting measurement um, just to see how much less heat the land put into the air um, because I, I don't know, as a, as a pilot, when you start to think about thermals and what effect thermals actually have on weather systems in an area, you start to realize how much the, the heat output of a given um, piece of property actually has on the local environment, so. If, if I if I may, just a quick follow up to that. Um, sure. You know, in, in Costa Rica, given given just the seasonality, you know, um, from thermal output and also water infiltration in a dry season versus rainy season, um, like how do you how do you keep a control on on that data study? Like if you're if you're looking at something in the rainy season when you're starting construction and then you're finishing construction, um, you know, in the dry season, it just seems like the, the seasonal effect doesn't, doesn't really give you a good basis for, for your data um, just because of the seasonal effect there. I don't know, you do at the same time of year? That's it. after, it's the exact same time of work? year. Yeah, okay. no, you do it in, this, in the same month. Um, mm -hmm. You just do it in the same month. And so from a, from a thermal aspect, you, if, you're, if you're doing, that one you want to make sure, even if it's in the same month, that it's similar weather conditions, right? Like obviously the thermal output in a cloudy day is going to be different from the thermal output in a sunny day. Um, but generally, um, you know, like the last project, we did it in the thermal output in December of, 
uh, where are we now? December of 2020 and the next one in de December of um, 21, just to see what the difference was, the delta between the two. And Got for it, infiltration, <laughs> it's a bit easier. You know, you don't have to worry about the weather condition, but generally just doing it in the same time of year gives you a good baseline. Uh, here Thanks for that, Danny. Jesse Blen. Thank you, Dennis, for your question. Can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. Like a dream. Okay. Uh, I actually wrote a comment. I'm sorry I'm late. My, our internet was off. So I've only been here for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you were talking about road projects uh, on, on our farm in Costa Rica. We, as I wrote in the comment, we had a muddy mess. We had a whatever, a couple hundred foot long driveway. And I didn't want to make a road, the standard road, you know, with grading and bringing in dump trucks of dirty gravel and, and having the runoff and all that. And I actually just started putting what they call pea gravel in all the areas that were soft. And over, uh, initially it worked really good. And with just a little bit of maintenance, we have a beautiful full grass driveway that nobody ever gets stuck in. We use it all year round with 200 inches of rain. So it's, uh, it's worked amazingly well. It's not, it's no money for the builders. So they will, you know, for the, for the guys with the dump trucks and stuff. So they won't tell you, oh, do that. They want to sell you a road with all the, problems of runoff and lack of rain penetration and all that it worked really well um, also I, I don't I'm just going to mention I've worked a lot with uh, hydraulic ram pumps which work great uh, we're with micro hydro also we're growing a solar for uh, nutrient recycling and things like that and I invented a a clogless intake filter for water systems which can go for months without uh, plugging up if anybody ever needs one of them but it, it's an interesting talk. I'm sorry I'm late. I will keep listening and thank you very much. No problem, Daniel. Thanks for sharing. And, and I hope you don't mind if I reach out to you separately. Um, but this is, um, this yeah, is, obviously, yes. the peak gravel is great. I'm curious how, how much traffic on the driveway, meaning is there like heavy construction traffic? Is it, is, how is it upheld? No, no, this would be, this would be to, a, to a home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not a main road. It's just to a, a dwelling and a shop. That works great. Cool. Yeah, we're actually several we're cars a week, but, but not every, every day. Okay. And it works great. It, it gets soft in a few places. We just, with a wheelbarrow, I just put a little more and it, we just cut the grass. You don't even see that the gravel is there. It's a nice grass driveway. And people used to get stuck where you'd have to call the neighbor with his oxen to pull them out. <laughs> and, and that totally stopped happening. We can get in and out fine all year. For Amazing. any residential type community, I'd highly recommend it. Very cool. Thank you for that. You know, we've also been we're 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 just shipping now a, a sample product down to um, to Costa Rica called Envira Seal, which is um, it's a topical application that you know uh, um, solidifies the surface and then prevents the dust buildup that you see a lot in the rain in the dry season. But uh -huh. yeah, but the grass um, the grass will grow through it. No, the grass will not grow through it. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if pea gravel can hold up, then it's a hell of a better solution. Yeah, it takes, you know, the first year, I mean, I had to put maybe 10, wheel, 10 wheelbarrow loads a year to, for maintenance, which isn't bad. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you, I, it's I nice don't even know. I, you source it locally, right? Pea gravel is available locally? Yeah, then? yeah. Okay, uh, cool. I put it in the right, they call it Piedra, Piedra Quinta. Uh -huh. Perfecto. Which is like Thank you what we would call it in English pea gravel. Yeah, thanks for that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good option for driveways, especially for any residential folks. On the yeah, call. if if you you know if you contact me, I can send you pictures of what it looks like and and all this. I mean, it's, it's just a nice gra grass entry. You Very cool. Never know the gravel's there, but it's solidified enough. We can have you know deliveries of materials all year round and go in and out, and no problem. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jesse, You're welcome. Here. Giving the mic to Fred now. Hey everyone, great, great, great uh, talk, Jack. Thanks for for all the valuable info. I, for those who, who don't know me, I actually work with CJ as well and work alongside Jack. And um, hey, Fred. Hey. <laughs> so my question was, what were the biggest challenges you had um, in in re with regards to environmental and social impact? in Alegria Village and how do you say 
you know, they can be mitigated in the future. Um, any lessons learned from that project? I think it would be a valuable tool to take to, to the people attending. Wow, Fred, you should have prepped me for that question. It's a big one. <laughs> Putting you in the spotlight. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> lessons learned from everything for sure. But I would say one of the biggest um, uh, I'll call, start with environmental. One of the biggest surprises was road surfacing, right? So uh, back to Dino's comments before, but you know, we in in eleven years now of of I'll call it responsible development work, even though it's changed from sustainable to regenerative to responsible. But in eleven years of development work, I, I've yet to find um, a, a an acceptable road solution, like road surfacing. And when I say acceptable, I mean, that meets all of the criteria that we're after, right? That is extremely permeable, that can handle heavy construction traffic, um, that is environmentally safe. <laughs> and um, uh, the closest thing that we've found that meets those criteria are permeable pavers. But for a large expanse of road, they tend to be cost prohibitive for the typical community. Um, and so uh, how would we address that in the future? Um, I, I'd say, we, you know, we, we, and you caught me a bit because we still have yet to hash out our lessons learned program with Alegria. We'll do it after closure. Um, but A is limiting the, num the road length as much as possible. And B, really um, almost starting the project with testing out different, uh, a wide variety of surfacing solutions because it, it's such a major part of any larger residential community um, that it's important, and not major from a, from a usage perspective, also from a financial perspective, because if a developer puts down one road solution and it doesn't work and they put down another road solution, it, it's, a, it's a huge cost. It's one of the largest costs that go into any community. Um, so in, in full transparency, I'd say the um, road surfacing is probably the biggest environmental challenge that we found um, in Alegria specifically. Um, uh, uh, let's see. I, I'm sure that there's other social ones and uh, and economic ones that we could talk about, but I, I'm, I'm put on the spotlight a little bit and can't necessarily think about it. But I'll stick with road solutions and answer your question in regards to environmental. Cool, yeah. I'll now give the mic to Mariela. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Hola. Hola, Mariela. As Fred, I also work in Hola, Hola. I also work in CJI and CJI. I'm new. Well, I I start in January, and it's really. I mean, thank you actually, Jack, for share your knowledge. I think is I appreciate that really much. I've been learning a lot uh, since I get here. But my question is, <laughs> uh, you were talking about how important it is to engage the local community in a project, isn't it? And you talk a lot about the benefits that doing. In that but i was wondering uh, if you see this like in a timeline in what part of this time like uh should be or or will be the best uh moment uh before the planning you know to have a sense of of the community of their needs or once you plan you include them because in some point i uh, well i know that because i have family in the south part of the country in the pacific Sometimes they are really uh, resistant, uh, or they doesn't feel um, happy. Let's say when they heard sometimes about this type of developments, because you know uh, you you know that they also could have a lot of problems then after, like gentrification or I don't know, um, like in Nosara that we we know about it. This uh, a huge uh, raise of the cost of living. And, and things like that. So in your experience, uh, how, I mean, how you can conciliate to involve the community in a, I will say in a 
in a truly way, you know, in the project, not just like two in appearance. And in one, in what moment of this timeline, uh, when you see the project life, when at the, you have the idea of develop or the resources and then to execute it. Thanks, Mary. Mariela, and I, I also appreciate you very much. So thanks for everything. But um, so short answer is as early as possible, but definitely during the planning phase. So during the planning phase, it's it's the needs assessment, right? So it, that's the that's the time. You know, the the community doesn't exist yet. The the um, the announcement that it's coming doesn't even necessarily exist yet. It's more uh, let's look at what the community needs and let's build that into our budget let's build that into our schedule let's build that into our communication plan um, and let's build that into our impact plan so you know during that planning phase is when you're creating all of those i'll call it project management procedures um, that are going to be actioned through the rest of the project right so how you're communicating with stakeholders and one of the biggest stakeholders is the local community and and to determine how you're communicating with stakeholders, um, you know, you need to know how the stakeholders prefer to be communicated with, right? So doing that analysis really as the as the foundational framework for um, for your planning exercises, you know, if you again a lot of the time I, I look at let's take an expat community that goes into a place like Costa Rica. And they say, ah, oh, well, what they really need is good transportation so they can get to work, you know, or what they really need is, um, you know, to learn healthier eating habits, you know, or whatever it is. I'm throwing these out randomly. No, nobody take offense, please, Nicole. Um, but, you know, to analyze that ahead of building your budget, because what you may find out is what they really need is a new school or what they really need is is a public park that the kids can go play in because there's nothing going on in town, right? Okay, well, a new school is going to cost X amount of money. So let's put that into the, into the budget or let's build it into our real estate sales, for example, so that half a percent of every sale goes towards the new school budget, you know, or the new park budget or whatever it is. So it, it's one of the first activities that should happen prior to taking investment, prior to um, finalizing what the development budget is and what the development schedule is. Um, I would say that that needs assessment is a first activity. I, ho I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Jack. I'm now giving the mic to Linda and Hunter. It's like warms my heart every time I see Linda and Hunter. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you said <laughs> you said that um, hemp is legal to use in construction now. Um, have they actually started to grow hemp in Costa Rica, or are they still? I don't know. Getting, um, I'm sorry, I didn't let you finish. No, I was finished. Okay. No, I, I don't know if anyone is growing it yet. Honestly. I have not talked to Ashley with Z Green Labs in about six months. Uh, um, somebody else on the call may know. Feel free to raise your hand if you do. So the the last I talked to Ashley, they were still importing their hemp, but it was before the um, the latest regulation was passed, and they were primarily promoting rice crete and uh, and some of the other byproduct industries. But particularly Fede Salas, I'm not sure if you know if anyone is actually. Um, doing production hemp in Costa Rica yet now? Does anyone? I'm going to ask him to unmute. Maybe he can illustrate us. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm unaware of any, uh, any projects related to hemp yet. I know that the law became uh, officially a, a law very recently and the application uh, of, of all of the proced procedures that it demands uh, is still happening, right? Because 
you'll need to get a license and, and that takes some time. <laughs> It, it takes some time for the institutions to actually adjust to what the law is requiring. At the moment, I am not aware of any uh, production, but um, I'm trying to convince my father, who is an agronomer, to, to <laughs> move into the business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fede. And I'll, I'll say for anybody on the call that is very entrepreneurial, um, you know, what we found in the U.S. when the hemp industry really started taking off is that lots of people got into growing hemp, but there was a severe shortage in processing hemp. Um, and so someone, many people, will be very successful in creating processing facilities to be able to actually turn the hemp herd in, into a usable product. It's extremely lucrative. Um, and I or we don't don't have time for it or the the um, the drive for it, but uh, but a processing facility um, at the start of this wave of you know influx of hemp usage will be extremely valuable. So uh, sorry, uh, Linda. I I guess that answers the question though. I I, I doubt it's yeah. I doubt it's being grown in any production format yet, but. But great potential. <laughs> great potential. The first steps. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have Camille with a question. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say about Luke, your question because recently, actually, this uh, weekend, I went on a in a workshop with Stephen Clark, which is a a very good person with hemp. He actually built the first hemp house here in Mexico. And this workshop was with the first hemp production in Mexico. So very interesting because he actually told me he is going to Costa Rica next on July 6th to meet Ashley from Sydney. <laughs> and I actually wanted to know too if they were growing hemp now in Costa Rica. But I guess it's like something that's growing a lot recently. And yeah, so let's see what's going on with that. I actually wanted to know that too, but the, the good thing is you can see it, it's very close now. So that it's actually happening here in Mexico. So it will definitely soon come to Costa Rica. And that's very exciting to see. Very cool. Thanks, Camille. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Jeff. Now, Francisco Grau has a question. Francisco, go ahead. Hola, hey Jack, thank you so much. Hola. Um, super, it was really fascinating to 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 hear the the, the seven ideas. Um, there's, I have a question in terms of uh, I was quite surprised by the um, like how big uh, the operation must be. You know, with several projects in different countries, Alegría alone is it's a huge project. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you what, what advice would you give in terms of like um, working with people? You know, like uh, in my experience, working with people is is uh, full of surprises and often tough. Um, so I wonder, you know, like uh, you, you're you're already working with a lot of people. So what what's your advice to to yeah to handle that load? Um, just to clarify, Francisco, so thanks for the question. Is it, um, do you mean more like from an employee team standpoint or suppliers or, or, or clients or, or which aspect? Uh, I, I was thinking more on, on the employee supplier side of uh, things. Um, but I mean, if you have an insight that is broader, I'm like happy to hear it. Ooh. Um, I don't know. I guess I generally I would say be kind and honest. <laughs> and I know that's pretty broad, but, um, you know, we've found that, uh, you know, the only times in my life that I got into trouble in relationships was, um, was if I wasn't fully authentic, you know, with what the intention was and with what, what the goal was. And, um, and so it, it's amazing how, um, it's amazing to, to see any of those roadblocks go away. So in, uh, you're in Costa Rica specifically? Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. 
um, you know, feel free to, um, I don't know if we share my email and my, my um, WhatsApp to Leah, but, but if we can on the follow-up email, it would be nice to share it. Um, Francisco, I'm happy to share any experiences with local suppliers um, and, um, you know, and recommendations on suppliers, depending on what your needs are there. Um, but, you know, we, so vendor management, depending on how big of a group you have, the idea of like uh, um, vendor analysis and vendor management, just taken from the corporate world, I guess, but, but turned into more of a responsible approach is extremely valuable in, in um, kind of creating those value metrics of what a vendor needs to do to be able to participate in the project. And it gets easier and easier the larger the project gets, right? Because the vendor will make more compromises. And so even more traditional vendors will be um, more likely to, to do what you require, um, you know, based on the size of the job that you're giving them. Um, and then, you know, to just treating everybody well, I guess it, it, I, I don't know. this is probably a much longer conversation that gets a lot more personal. Um, but in, in general, um, uh, I, I think that I've never really felt like I was better than anyone. <laughs> you know, everyone else, you, there's something to learn from everyone, right? And chances are, uh, um, uh, chances are it can be beneficial to the initiative. So I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about this on a, on a, on a separate forum. Um, but in, in the meantime, just in regards to projects in Costa Rica specifically, I'm happy to share, uh, you know, any resources or contacts or lessons learned from vendors and suppliers um, that we can share. I don't know how helpful that is or if it answers your question, but. Yeah, thank you. No, no, I, I think it's a really answer uh, yeah, uh, yeah i think it's a brilliant answer and, and maybe we cool. could have a, a chat someday and <laughs> anytime yeah man <laughs> authenticity yeah <laughs> awesome i love it thank you very much <laughs> yeah delaya we can't hear you if you're talking <gasps> sorry i was just saying sophie has a question and i was unmuting her and thank you, Francisco. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I also work in CJI, and I also have some experience um, with community work and community assessment. So I have a question regarding that subject as well, Jack. Um, how would you convince like your regular um, developer, like the guy that really wants to make the most, or a girl, sorry, that, that really wants to make the most out of the, the project, the most profit out of the project to implement a strategy like community assessment. Like what ways, in what ways would you approach that, those selling points? How would you sell those really important strategies for sustainability? Thanks, Sophie, for the question. Um, and it's a good one. So for those that don't know, Sophie, and for everybody in Costa Rica, um, in your follow up on the survey, please ask for Sophie's email if you're interested, because Sophie has a nonprofit in Costa Rica called, called Semillas um, that does exactly that, community assessments of particular um, communities to see what the need is when they go in. Um, so they're a fantastic team to work with and, uh, uh, and I highly recommend them. Uh, and Sophie, I think it ties back into the entire kind of all of this, right? How do, how do we convince them that it's, it's better to do it responsibly than it is to do it not responsibly, right? Or how is it better to make sure that they have a positive impact on the community rather than not have a positive impact on the community? Um, and I, I, I'd say off the top of my head, I, I, I can't really answer, you know. Um, I'm sure that there are um, 
uh, metrics that can be created that will show the measurement of what that value is, what that value proposition is of making sure you're working with the community. But I think in general, it would be to present case studies of, you know, this was, this was a, a development that went into a community and did everything wrong. And this was the extra hurdles that they encountered as a result of that entrance, right? Or this is a community development that went in and analyzed first and involved the local community in what they were doing. And this was how fewer the hurdles they had as a result, right? Um, so, you know, people, the general human psyche, I think, is is um, more prone to uh, seeing examples and actually uh, like case studies of successes and failures. And so, the more successes that you're able to present from groups that have done it correctly um and the hurdles you know even the even if they and you know the community in the end was a success the the the, the normal don't care about the community kind of vibe even if in the end you know they sold out and they did their thing and um but chances are they had a lot more problems along the way right with the municipality or with um roadblocks even or, or whatever it is and so uh, the, i guess uh, sorry i'm thinking out loud which is kind of how this goes i guess case studies would be my best answer case studies <laughs> thank you jack uh, i don't see any other hands raised so maybe jack you wanna uh, address everybody there i'll do it with this slide <laughs> um thanks so much for attending i hope it was beneficial i have no idea if it was but i hope it was um we'll probably do more of these and um you know i look forward to seeing everybody again and please don't hesitate to reach out um you know cji as a company obviously is happy to do whatever from a service perspective, but then we're also happy to do whatever from a sharing perspective. For so, for those of you that have similar projects, you know, if you're looking for um, uh, impact me metric measurement templates, if you're looking for supplier vendor management, you know, any kind of templates or, or whatever we can do. Our goal is that the, the most people are doing <laughs> things well and responsibly. Um, and so whatever we can do to further that cause, basically. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time and really appreciate you coming. Thank you all. Thanks. I'm asking you Have all to unmute night. to say goodbye if you want. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Blessings and thank you. I appreciate it. Gracias. Chao. Gracias. Gracias. Bye. Hasta luego.